Kentucky. Uh, she's Dr. Nora McRae. Uh, Dr. Nora McRae is Associate Provost, Cooperative and Experiential Education and Adjunct Faculty Member of the Department of Psychology at the University of Waterloo. Uh, Nora sits on the exec Executive Board of the World Association of uh, Cooperative and Work Integrated Education or WASTE. Uh, everyone, please join me to welcome Nora. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. Um, shall I take it from here? Yes, please. OK, thank you for the, the lovely introduction and it's it's lovely to see you all here. Um, it did, did uh, introduce me, so you've got a bit of an idea of my background. I've been working in this field of cooperative and work integrated education since 1992, where I started um, working as a coordinator, connecting students who were studying humanities and fine arts, find co-op work terms uh, in on the western side of Canada. And I did that for a number of years, and then I moved into different positions, uh, working with students in business, working with students in all disciplines. Uh, at the same time, I started a research agenda and did my own PhD. I graduated, uh, finished that PhD 10 years ago, looking at what are the conditions that enable transformative learning when we're doing programs like co-op and work integrated education. And I used activity theory in that research, and so I'll share a little bit about that with you today. I've been at the University of Waterloo for uh, about five and a half years, and this is a very large university with a very high number of students participating in programs like cooperative education. And uh, we have about 25,000 students who do these work terms in uh, 120 different academic programs. So it's a large program and it it has uh, a number of other units that I work with, our career unit and our professional development unit, and they all work together. And I'll talk a little bit about how they all work together to help us uh, work and develop our students through these programs. So what I would love to know is a little bit about each of you. So if you would uh, be so kind as to introduce yourself. Tell me what program you're in. You know, I think some of you are doing your master's and some of you are doing your PhD, as I believe. Is that correct? OK, and what your area of interest is. What are you interested in? Why are you in these programs? Why are you studying this? So. Sumitra, would you like to start? Yes, good morning, Nora. Uh, um, Can you turn your volume up a bit? You're quite soft. It's very hard to hear you, Sumitra. Can you hear me? No, not really. Shall we st should we try someone else as you try and, and uh, get your system to work? OK, all right. Um, Ian, did you want to introduce yourself? So, E M M. Hello. Hello. Can Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for um um uh, this morning. Um. Um. Firstly, I would like to say it is um. um my first experience um learning in the morning very morning um i i have listened to um uh, the, uh, your introduction it has been uh, very interesting and uh it really um matches uh, with uh, what i am learning um first i would like to say my name is uh, Sarai Roran. Uh, I am from uh, Cambodia, and now I am um, doing my 
um, PhD uh, courses in uh, cooperative education at um, the Institute of uh, Social um, uh, Technology and Serenity University um, Technology in, uh, in Thailand. But uh, now I am in Cambodia because um, we are doing our course uh, online. And uh, honestly, before I uh, started the course, I uh, knew nothing about um, cooperative education, but after um, starting for um, one trimester, I uh, become um, known about the importance of cooperative education and I really like it. And in the future, I would like to um, apply what I have learned from Thailand uh, with uh, 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 Cambodian people. Um, from the cooperative education with uh, the Cambodian people. I, re I really like this course. Thank you so much. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, Peng So U. Yes, uh, good morning. Can you hear me very well? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Pai So So I am from Myanmar, currently in Thailand, SUD, to learn um, COVID education program for doing a master degree. I interested about um, like assessment and measurement in the COVID education. I'm thinking about doing my research for this uh, because I thought it's really important and we need to know whether that program is really effective or not. So we need to think about the assessment. So if uh, we cannot uh, think about the effective assessment system. It can also cannot work very well because we cannot know exactly uh, what are the performance of the student and whether these performance can meet with our expectation or not. So that's why I think this area is quite important. I'm interested to do my research for that. Thank you. Mm. Excellent. That's that's a great area of research. That's wonderful. Um, Manirat. Chenchuti Manarat. Sawadika. Good morning, Nora. Good morning, or good evening for me. Good morning for you. Oh, good evening for you, yes. <laughs> Canada. <laughs> uh, I am also learning about a uh, learning doctoral degree in cooperative education. Why I still working full time, I work uh, at the hospital in like uh, a customer care related position. So my job is not uh, focused about the, the teaching, but sometimes I have to teach uh, some uh, assistant of the doctor. And for so I have to teach him, so I want to gain more knowledge uh, to improve my work. So I, I choose this program to study. And also the first time I don't know anything about the, the cooperative education, but after I learned from this uh, university, so I know about like this program is make me more perspective, especially send, um, about the, when, when the university send the student to the um, workplace. So, so it's like, it's fortunately for the student right now, it's not for me for a long time ago. I have no one to guidance me. Mm. And this is this course very, very important for students in everywhere in the world. I think I think like that. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. And uh, some interesting examples in healthcare as well for these yeah. programs. So that's that's great with your background at the hospital. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Sumitra, do you think you want to give it another try? Oh, it's an on. Cannot. Yeah, I wonder what's the problem. It's hard to hear you. I mean, we can sort of very faintly hear you if you speak loudly. Uh, yes, I, I changed to use this microphone. Have, have you heard? You heard me? Yeah. Not really. No, too bad. Okay. Well, let's go on to the last student, Song Tam. Song Tam, yes. do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, but first of all, I would like to say sorry. My camera is cannot, it doesn't work. 
All right, no, that's fine. Okay, have good morning, everyone. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Song Tham. Since since 2018, I I have a good chance to meet Dr. Atit at Suranali University of Technology. At that time, I was working at the Japanese company to collaborate with the university for cooperative education. So mm. that at that time, I I learned about the cooperative program. And until now, I work, I am studying PhD program of cooperative education. For my interesting area, I think it it very benefit for workplace and university to prepare the readiness of the manpower planning in the future. So mm -hmm. that I think is a good chance for me to study in cooperative program. That's all. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. OK, so Sumitra, if you're still having trouble, what you could do is put in the chat um, a little bit about yourself, what area you're in, you're interested in. Kind of, Are you a master's or a PhD student? You know, that kind of thing, just to give me an idea of uh, what your focus Dada, is. Okay. Dada, uh, Ada Sumitra is the one of the faculty member from the uh, Corporate oh. Education. So oh, she she's a faculty finished. member. Well, for goodness sake. Yeah, yeah. OK. So she is now uh, participate in this class. <laughs> very good. So you're teaching in the program, Sumitra. Ah, very nice, very nice. And so I'd be very interested to know what your area of specialization is in in your teaching. What do you teach the students? What subjects? What um, is your focus area? Okay. So uh, I don't know. Uh, Professor Atit, did you want to introduce yourself anymore? Did you want to say anything about yourself no, and your no, interests? No. You're good? No, I'm good okay. now. All right, you're good. OK. All right, um, then what I thought I would do is ask you, you've had a chance to see the video that I sent to Professor Atit, right? Correct? You've seen the video? And you had a chance to read the article, correct? The chapter in yeah. the um, handbook? OK. So. Just as the as the beginning, any any thoughts, any reflections, any um, ideas that that come to mind when you think about that material? What what is it? What have you learned from that? What thoughts do you have about what was in that material? If you'd like to speak, you just put your hand up and then I'll call on you. So what, I'll, what I will do is, is if you don't volunteer, I'll ask each of you in turn to give me one, one key idea that came to you as a result of that learning of that material. OK. All right, so Seb, please go ahead. Thank you. Me? Yes. Oh, OK, so I, I just read about uh, the article. <clears throat> I also do reflect for this. So like uh, learning ecosystem, enhances to understand your agency through more integrated planning. So where I found most interesting idea is um, in this core, everything changing very fast. Mm -hmm. uh, now, so AI technology make everything to be unpredictable for the future. So in the previous time, so we can think about what kind of skill or what kind of um, maybe ability can be sufficed for us for a long time. But these days, very difficult to predict. So mm -hmm. what is going to be on in the future? So that's why the concept that highlight in this uh, paper, like called the v, uh, VUCA. So I know oh, that this is really quite, yes, mm -hmm. uh, quite interesting. So maybe uh, um, as the faculty member, as the uh, education facilitators or teachers need to be think about uh, the effective way so that can be suffice for the student for a long time and also reduce their anxiety and, and suddenly about the career opportunity and also uh, think about the skill to develop for the career. So this thing is, I think, important and also the ecosystem. So I like the question uh, uh, in the ecosystem. This is like uh, what um, 
So sometimes the students, including me, and so in the long time ago, so firstly, I graduated from the bachelor degree in engineering, but now totally different. The career is changed because if I, I just thought that after I read this article, if I read this article, maybe 10 or, or more than 10 years ago, I will find my career part. So in this uh, article, so it gave the question, uh, what do we love? Uh, what do we good at? And uh, what does the world need? What can we get paid for? So this is like a kind of the self-reflection that can help mm -hmm. students to more understanding about themselves and what they really want to do. So uh, I think this idea are really important that I learned this idea from this article. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, good. Excellent reflection. Who would like to go next? Uh, Songtan? Yes, please. For mm -hmm. my idea. Additional from Paiso. The VUCA world is now is the new world that we are facing it mm -hmm. and for the future and our next generation i think sdg the goal 17 goals is our expectation to keep all our resources for the next generation so that i think we have to consider with the sdg to align with the cooperative education program mm -hmm. that's for my thoughts thank you okay very good excellent manurat for me i think this article highlight about the important about the reflection pack piecing in uh in this program and uh i think the integrated integrating reflection can be can play like, throughout the learning in the program. I mean, when, when you send the student to the workplace, so uh, reflection can be every, every time when you send the student to the workplace. And um, the article is the like, value of metacognition of self-awareness. And um, I mean, how to work with the people is a very important for the student. Mm -hmm. For me. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Learning how to work with other people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. and the role of programs like cooperative education to help build that capability as well as the reflection. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Sarah Rath? Hey, once again, thank you, uh, Professor, for um, giving me opportunity uh, uh, to reflect on what I, uh, I I have read. Um, so I would like to uh, continue something um, from uh, Manirat, from uh, Song Tram and Ping Su about um, uh, the article. The article is a, a book chapter. It is a really good one. Um, and finally, um, uh, the chapter. Uh, I change my whole view on uh, cooperative education that we can say uh, shortly go off and uh, well integrated learning, uh, we can say will. Um, it made me think more about the idea of uh, learning ecosystem. And before mm -hmm. I only thought uh, co-op was uh, for children um, to get hands on experience that uh, match um, their study. But now after reading um, this chapter, after reading this article, I um, see how all the different parts of learning are connected uh, in a big way. Um, and more, um, this new understanding means uh, a co-op should not be uh, separated, the ties, uh, separated from the ties uh, of learning, but part of uh, the whole education journey for students. Mm -hmm. students. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, what I have changed uh, has affected how I uh, make co-op program. Now I try to make sure that uh, uh, co-op program improve theory, um, skill training, and time 
uh, for sinking back on what um, was learned. And also um, the article of chapter show me how important it is for students um, to take control over what uh, uh, they have learned and where they go in, the, uh, uh, in uh, their careers. Uh, this is uh, 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 what uh, the, uh, the reflection from the article uh, has changed what I think with uh, cooperative education. Thank you, okay. Professor. Good. OK, very good. Um, Sumitra, I see that you've put a note in the chat. OK. Um, oh, great. OK. Interested in soft skills and employability skills, including student counseling, background psychology. OK, excellent. That's great. Thank you for giving me that background. That's very helpful. Um, OK, so what I would like to do now. Thank you very much for those reflections. Actually, that was really good. Uh, you've clearly uh, taken in the material and given it some thought. And so what I'm going to do now is give another a bit of a brief presentation. Some of the concepts are re repeating what was in the article and in the video just to bring that home again. Please feel free to stop me if you have any questions. And then when I'm finished this um, presentation and I'll share my own screen, then I'd like us to have a bit more of a discussion on what what this additional material, what it, it's made you think about, what are some of the critiques you might have or questions or that you would like to explore, and also what this might make you think of doing differently or studying more of after this is done. OK, are we good? OK, so uh, Sarah Rath, you may want to put your hand down. That would be great. And I'm going to um, share my screen. All right, um, let's see, do that. And we're going to do that. OK, can you see my screen? I cannot see any of you, so someone needs to say something. Yes, it's perfect. Oh, yes. OK, good, thank you very much. All right, I'll keep going then. Yes, it's quite clear. OK, thank you, I appreciate it. So this is, um, if you ever come to Waterloo and Professor Atit has been here, this is our building on the campus where we do all of our work. And it's it's always nice to get a sense of uh, where where we do our work. Um, we're located about an hour and a half. If you know where Toronto is in Canada, about an hour and a half southwest of Toronto. All right. The tradition at our institution before we do a presentation is to acknowledge um, the traditional territory uh, that we're located on, which is of the indigenous people of the region. So in the case of the University of Waterloo, we acknowledge that our work takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus is situated on the Haldeman Tract, and this was land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. And our active work toward reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching and community building and is centralized within the Office of Indigenous Relations. And we have a staff member who's an associate director of Indigenous Relations that helps us connect our work with Indigenous students and Indigenous community. All right, so you already mentioned the VUCA concept. So again, just to indicate that absolutely this, this concept, which is a term that came out of, um, I think the 1980s is, is when it was first, first identified, but really showing that the world we're living in, and certainly this isn't getting any, it isn't changing. Uh, in fact, it seems to be even more volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous, which means that the way we educate our students needs to be able to give them the skills to navigate such a complicated, changing, fast changing world. And this is um, a very important role that cooperative education and work integrated learning can play in these kinds of um, in the kinds of conditions that we see ourselves in right now. We also see a shift from Industry 4.0 towards Industry 5.0. 
And you're, I'm sure, very very familiar with this concept of the different stages of the of industry over time, starting with you know the beginnings of mechanization, all the way up to where we are now. And industry 5.0 is the idea here that as AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning, and um, more sophisticated forms of um, interconnectedness that this allows us will also change the way of the future of work and how work is done and how we need to be prepared for that. It allows for a tremendous opportunity for personalization, for us to um, really get huge benefit from computers that are working very quickly for us. But there's always the risk with this kind of shift towards even more dependence on computers, um, a, a a loss of jobs for some sectors of our economy and with young people how do we help train them and give them the skills to work effectively with computers with artificial intelligence and not just be subject to being replaced by that technology and also what role can our students play in helping our industry partners adapt to this change in technology, which is happening very, very rapidly. So what does all of this mean for the future of work? As part of um, my office, we have a research institute called the Work Learn Institute, and it does research in um, cooperative education and the learning that's required for programs to be successful and how we can help our students and our employers be successful. And one research project that they did a number of years ago, about three years ago, was looking at the future of work. And they did a meta study of different research on the future of work and identified six key themes for the future of work that when we're thinking about cooperative education programs, we need to keep in mind so that we're doing what's relevant and valid. So one of the, the first theme is advances in technology. I've just made reference to that with respect to industry 5.0 and artificial intelligence and, and other forms of technology that are advancing very, very rapidly. And one of the important uh, features that we need to build into our programs is the opportunity for students to keep on top of those advances in technology so that they can bring those into industry. Um, that brings me to the next point, which is skill, agility, and transferability. This is the concept that in the future of work, skills can be gained in all sorts of settings, and this is hard skills and soft skills. But what's really important is that uh, learners and workers know how to transfer those skills in different contexts. So they may have learned them in this kind of industry, but then be able to be able to use them and develop, continue to develop them and apply them appropriately in different industries or different settings. So this skill agility and transferability is really, really important as the demand for being adaptive becomes more and more important. And that's the third point, this responsibility for adaptation. What this, what this means is with these rapid changes, everyone needs to be very flexible and nimble and to be able to adapt. That means students and learners need to be able to adapt. We as educators need to be able to adapt our curriculum to support them. Industry needs to adapt and even governments need to be supporting this adaptation so that skills are developed and talent is developed in a way that continues to contribute to society. The fourth point is fostering EDIR, or this is our terminology for equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism. So this is making sure that whatever we do, we're not creating, we, we are doing everything we can to make for very inclusive environments. There are no barriers for our students to engage so that their talents can be fully brought to bear in workplaces and that there isn't something that underlying structural or, or um, or even less, less formal than structural barriers, but anything that can get in the way of students being fully included and able to access opportunity. The fifth ca uh, category is gig economy and precarious work. So this really 
speaks to the fact that in the future, that right now and increasingly in the future of work, we are going to be seeing our students graduate into long time careers. They're going to have shorter and shorter and shorter work opportunities. And in, in some cases, as short as small gigs or projects, and they might jump from project to project to project. And how to help them do that um, in a way that is not uh, precarious, in, such that they still are able to support themselves and develop and grow. So this different kind of work and helping them engage in that different kind of work, but do it in such a way that they are still gaining value is important. And the final category is about values. We've done quite a bit of research on the differences between values of an employee or a student or young talent versus an organization and the importance of having that value, those values be aligned so that students can see that the organizations they're working in, there's a good fit for their values and that uh, the organization is speaking about their values very clearly. This all leads to more meaningful work, more motivated employees and better outcomes all over all around. I just wanted to pause for a second and talk about some definitional work that has been done across Canada. So in Canada, we have a national association that's called CWIL, so it's Cooperative Education and Work Integrated Learning, C-E-W-I-L, Canada. And that's our national association. Similarly, in Thailand, you have TACE. So same thing in Canada. And we have defined work integrated learning uh, as being a form of curricular experiential education. So experiential education is a much broader category. And within that, there's a subset of learning, which is work integrated learning. And what makes it different um, or, or a subset of experiential education is that it formally integrates a student's academic studies with quality experiences within a workplace or practice setting. So these experiences are an engaged partnership between the institution, the host organization and the student. And they can occur at a course level, a program level, but the outcomes really are related to employability, agency, knowledge and skill, mobility and lifelong learning. And this is how we look at the full spectrum of work integrated learning or work integrated education, as it might be called across Canada. Furthermore, we've identified nine different types of work integrated learning in Canada, and those are cooperative education, which is the one that um, we're familiar with at the University of Waterloo, apprenticeships, entrepreneurship, internships, service learning, field placement, research projects, clinical placement or practicum, and work experience. So across any university or college in Canada, we find these nine different types, and it depends on the type of institution, the type of academic program, and other things that determine which kind of work integrated learning is being used, but they all have similar characteristics. So I want now to talk a bit more about this activity theory. So if you're familiar with activity theory at all, and there was a little bit in that chapter, it comes from work of, of Finnish, Finnish, Finnish researcher uh, Engstrom, who looked at, started this thinking about um, an ecosystem for learning and what needs to be in place for there to be effective learning. And this theory talks about various components that need to be in place. There need to be tools so learners have to have the right tools at their disposal to be able to learn well there has to be a division of labors different people doing different things in the learning there's a community of practice whether it's fellow students in the classroom or others there are certain rules that guide the learning and these are some of the key components for this ecosystem and all of these components interact with each other so Tools interact with the community, division of labor or who's doing what interacts with tools, the rules interact, everything has this interactive system uh, way of operating. So they're not uh, black and white, they're not linear, they're actually very interactive. 
And in the case of um, when we're looking at work integrated learning, the subject is the student and the object is whatever the goal is for that work integrated learning program. So it could be that the goal is to be having um, specific skills that are developed. Uh, it could be a different kind of learning outcome that's that is is um, of interest. So the object is what the outcome is from the students engaging in this system of learning that involves co-op or work integrated education. And because we don't work and live in a vacuum, and the fact that our work takes place with putting having students work in workplaces and practice settings, we know that the external environment is extremely important because that determines where students are going to be working or how they might be engaging and in which kind of partnerships with industry or community organizations or whatever. So the external environment is very much at play with this system, which does not operate in a vacuum. The ecosystem is part of a bigger ecosystem. So when we think of the subjects, the students, as I mentioned, uh, there's lots of research, I'm sure you've already looked at it, about work integrated learning or co-op. It really helps build those skill sets needed for the future of work, which I some of those challenges that I mentioned. Um, students are able to work in different industries or different workplace settings that allows them to transfer their skills in different ways and learn what's needed in different contexts. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they're also offered a breadth and depth of experiences. <clears throat> oh, got a dry throat. Um, and finally, this helps this continuing to support reflective practice, and I'll talk a bit more about that. And doing being intentional around that really can help students find this this concept of purpose and meaning, which is very important and develops a lifelong learning mindset, which is a huge indicator for ongoing career success. So when we think of the tools, the top of that pyramid of the uh, activity theory ecosystem, the tools that we use for quality work integrated learning are we, we use this concept of PEAR, P-E-A-R, and that any quality work integrated learning needs to have some key actions, quality actions within them, no matter which of the nine types, whether it's cooperative education or internships or work experience, whichever one, they all need to have these four things going on. These are the key tools to make it work. There has to be pedagogy. So that's pedagogy that connects the students to the world of work. It's also pedagogy that helps them engage uh, meaningfully in that workplace. So that when they have E for experience, those experiences are meaningful and substantial. There is assessment and the assessment is of the learning outcomes that are identified as being uh, what the program wants the students to learn. So what are those skills? What are the soft skills or hard skills that are hope to be developed as a result of work integrated learning. So that's the assessment and R is reflection that all of this has to be continually reflected upon before, during and after each experience, because of course, without reflection, there isn't learning and that reflection enables this learning to be deepened and under and students to really understand what it means for them. So pair P E A R are the key components of quality work integrated learning. And no matter what type of work integrated learning, you want to see these things at play. The other uh, point of the triangle, division of labor, is about who, different people doing different things in the ecosystem, different units. So for example, the academic units have a role in the ecosystem. The academic units are the ones that provide the content the field the, of discipline, the discipline study, the technical expertise that students need to be effective in workplaces. So academic units and the rigor of those programs gives uh, the students, that's what they're applying in workplaces, that learning, that theory. You will have in any kind of institution that does co-op or work integrated learning, you'll have some kind of work integrated learning unit, so an office such as the office that that I oversee to make sure that the program can work. So there's some kind of uh, office or unit or department to make cooperative education actually function. There are often career units. So these are 
units that work with students as they're getting ready to graduate and look at their full time career. And that is also part of a group of individuals working in this ecosystem and this division of labor that comes together. And finally, every institution, there are other supports that are there to make sure that the programs run, whether that's funding, whether that's research, whether that's infrastructure, whatever that is, and different um, units across campus make it all work so that the cooperative education program can run and do what it wants, needs to do, which is connecting what students are studying to the world of work. The other part of the ecosystem are the rules that apply. And because work integrated learning is curricular, then the academic policies and procedures that are, are, are at play at a university um, apply to work integrated learning. So there might be rules around what's required to progress in one's in, in the degree or complete the degree, graduation requirements. There may be rules about student conduct and that those rules would apply whether the students are in the classroom or whether they are in a workplace. There may be some rules about academic integrity, and those again would apply whether they're in a classroom or the same concepts of, of uh, plagiarism or cheating or whatever around integrity apply in the workplace. For example, we're starting to see more and more and more students complete their work in workplaces using AI devices such as chat GPT. So there's some ethical considerations around that. It may be fine as long as the employer knows what they're doing and how they're doing it. But if these concepts of academic integrity um, and, eth and ethics apply in work integrated learning as well as in academic classrooms. And finally, in the context of Canada, we do have an accreditation program so that co-op programs have a fully quality assured accreditation. Um, and that also has a set of rules that each co-op program in Canada must abide by in order to maintain or obtain their accreditation. And career units also have guidelines established by the Canadian Career Centre. So, the community of it, that in I, I talked about the external environment as well around that circles around the activity theory ecosystem. And in the context of work integrated learning, we use this quality framework, this AAA quality work integrated learning framework. And if you go to our website, you can find it. It's referenced in the chapter. Um, but we think of five key stakeholders in, in the external environment that engages with quality work integrated learning. We have students, of course, the institution, educators, but we also and we have the employer and we have governments and and advocates of governments and advocates of all of these stakeholders, actually. So there are five key stakeholders that are we are all needing to be interacting with or thinking about. And each of those has certain goals or aims to participate or support work integrated learning. So for example, typically government is interested in supporting work integrated learning. And there have been some examples of this in Thailand um, because they want to see students who graduate have uh, strong employment. And so they'll support work integrated learning to support the objective of having employ uh, employment rates that are good and strong for graduates. Uh, employers typically, what are their goals is to get talent. They want talent to meet their organizational needs. Students want to learn and to get jobs. Typically, their parents want that as well. Educators want the benefits of work integrated learning or cooperative education, which allows for a deeper understanding of the theory that's being taught. And institutions typically, what they want is it often relates very much to recruitment of students and retention of students and other benefits of having robust co-op programs. So that's an example of the type of stakeholders involved in the external environment and the um, aims or the goals that they might have, which are which are different based on the stakeholders. OK, so all of this comes together at the University of Waterloo, just to let you know a little bit more about us. Uh, we've been doing this work for 65 years. Uh, we were the first in Canada and are the largest. 
doing this work with, um, as I mentioned, 25,000 students in 120 programs. So we have all of our programs have co-op as an option. Uh, and uh, students work across Canada as well as internationally. And I've mentioned as part of the portfolio and my ecosystem, we've got this research institute. We have um, work integrated learning programs and the career center as well. So I've talked about the triangle, the subject and the tools, the division of labor, the community that's that's involved. So those stakeholders and the rules that apply to co-op and work integrated learning. These things all happen in our ecosystem. But what is the object? So that is what is the goal that we want for our students as a result of all of this work in our ecosystem? And for us, the object that we're looking on, looking at is this based on this concept of well-being or purpose. And this is what uh, you already identified in the reading is this this model for basically for well-being. It's the ability for students having gone through our programs to not only get a job and not only contribute to employers, but to have a better sense of what their purpose is that through reflecting as they go through the programs, they will get a better sense of what they love, what they're good at, what the world needs and what they can get paid for. And it's based on this Ikigai model from a Japanese concept. So why do we think this important? Why do we think that purpose is important? Well, we think it's important because um, it is clear that a strong sense of purpose is critical for building resilience and uh, adaptation. And going back to concepts about the VUCA world and a highly variable world, the more someone is rooted in their purpose, it really helps them be grounded and navigate um, these big challenges that they're facing. They are also better positioned to develop those uniquely human skills such as creativity, collaboration, communication, social and emotional intelligence, which at this point cannot be replicated with AI. So these are some of the key, the key skills that we want our students to really, really develop so that they can't be just overrun, especially early in their careers with automation and AI. And the future of work starts with identity, and that identity must be rooted in purpose. This is why purpose is so important and why we have identified it as an object of our work. So if we go back to this concept of um, the external environment, employers, host organizations, government, community broadly, the triangle, the tools that are based in that pair framework, academic units and units, academic rules, our students, and their un and the object being understanding of agency and purposeful work. That's our ecosystem. And how do we get there? How, what are the things that we do? Uh, we get them to focus in on these four domains. We get them to reflect on what their values and needs are and how they can explore those. <coughs> And here are some of the things that help them identify their values and needs. We get them to think about what could they be good at. And this concept we use for this is our future ready talent framework. So again, that's referenced in the paper. This is uh, based on a considerable amount of research on the future of work and what talents are going to be needed to be successful in the future of work. And there are 12 of them that we've identified, and these are what we want students to be assessing. So part of that pair framework, the assessment, the A, assessing these learning outcomes so that they are developing the capabilities and the talents that they're going to need. And the engagement, uh, that they have the opportunity to engage at the University of Waterloo is through cooperative education. 75% of our students do co-op and we have other forms of work integrated learning that they can engage in. And then finally, what does the world need? We use the SDGs as a way to talk about what the world needs. 
The reason we use these 17 of them is because they can, they, it's a broad enough framework that no matter what a student is studying, they can find their way in the SDGs, whether it's undergraduate or graduate, or no matter what the discipline area is, there's a way for them to identify what the world needs using the SDGs or the Sustainable Development Goals as a frame of reference. So if we put that all together, this is how we help them reflect upon, um, upon these four domains, values and needs, talents and skills, impact and engagement. And through that ongoing reflection that we provide them with opportunity to do that through each of their work terms, each of their work integrated learning experiences, when they're doing career education and career counseling, we're getting them to reflect around this concept such that they get clearer and clearer about what purpose and purposeful work is going to mean for them. So that is the, the, the system in a nutshell, gives you the frameworks, gives you the reflective tools that we use so that they have this outcome of understanding their agency and purposeful work. So why do we do it? We feel that uh, not only does it improve employability, because we know that that's what cooperative education and work integrated learning does, but it also really, um, and through all of the things that we know about that, it also gives them this opportunity to develop this lifelong learning mindset, really hone in on those, those capabilities and the development of those capabilities that can't be replicated by AI and ground themselves in a sense of meaning and purpose. And for our industry and community partners, uh, we know that this work uh, co-op programs and work integrated learning programs are very good for employers. It really um, adds value to, to them because of the work that our students do. They have better economic contributions. They have improved satisfaction and they feel much better about the talent that, that they're being provided um, for their own needs as an organization. And similarly, it gives them an awareness of what's needed uh, that how the labor market is changing and how the SDGs also apply to them and what they need to be thinking about. OK, so that is that is the. End of that, I'm going to stop sharing. And. I'd like to see if there are any comments or questions. OK, so let's see what you've got in the chat here. Uh, yeah, so that's a good question that which is the most effective? All of them should be using pair as an as an underpinning, no matter what type. I would say that the the, the, the concept that I think about in terms of effectiveness, a lot of it has to do with intensity. And that's time, the concept of time on task. So if you have a co-op or a work integrated learning experience that's only maybe two weeks long, it's not going to be nearly as intense as if someone is out working for three or four months. So much of the difference in those different models is the amount of time that the student is out in a workplace. So there is, so I think intensity is really important. Um, and but they should all be using pair. So if it's an internship, there should be a connection to pedagogy. It should be an experience that's meaningful. There should be assessment of learning outcomes. There should be meaningful reflection, no matter what the type. But if you've got a very short period of time, there isn't that much time to really, really get it, you know, really make connect those dots, really build those capabilities. So I think that to me is the difference between those different types is the intensity of the learning experience. Thanks, Sumitra. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Uh, so how about the accredit accreditation for yeah. the uh, WIO program? So if students choose like intensive or like the project work, so it will be short time. A corporate education, so it will be a little bit longer because they have to spend 
um, more tie on the organization or the company. So if um, maybe one student shows internship, one student shows like the co-op program, right? So how will accreditation be adjusted uh, to be able to be graduated? Okay, so depends on the academic program and how they're structured. So some, some will, and, and we have this at the University of Waterloo, some will say you must do co-op work terms. And one of the differences is that there are more co-op work terms than in internships. So we have co-op work terms, we have internships. Here's the difference. If you're studying engineering at the University of Waterloo, you will do six co-op work terms. Each one will be four months long and full time. So by the time you graduate, you have 24 months of related work experience. So that's what I mean by intensity. We have other programs that have an internship and they will have one four month experience. So instead of 24 months, they'll have four months. Now, in terms of the degree requirement, if that's what the program has identified, they, the students will graduate with that and they will meet their degree requirements. The accreditation refers specifically to only the co-op program so that across Canada we have we are very consistent with co-op programs because they are accredited so they are always a certain number of weeks they're always paid they have certain attributes which are the same and that gives gets the co-op accreditation but that's not doesn't necessarily relate to whether or not a, an academic program requires that for degree completion okay thank you Um, professor, I, I heard you uh, were talking something about um, SDG. Yeah. Um, so um, can you elaborate more thing about SDG? Uh, is there um, a connection between uh, SDG and co-op? Thank you. Yes. The, the way that we make that connection is we, we first of all, build awareness in our students about what the SDGs even are so that they understand what they even are. And some programs at the university spend a lot of time and some don't have as much information about it. So we, we provide some information about it so that students, when they're on a work term, can be thinking about, hmm, when I'm on this work term, is there an SDG that I might be working on or might be helping to advance as a result of my work on this work term. So for example, maybe they're working with a company that's their business is about developing clean energy. Okay, so then the students can make the connection between all oh, this work is working with clean energy and oh, that is actually something that the SDGs are concerned about too. Or they might be working around uh, programs in community that deal with poverty. That's also an SDG. So we help them see that there's this broader frame of reference, which are the SDGs, and that in fact, they might be working on something during their work terms where they're actually contributing to advancing an SDG. What we've done in the last year is uh, we have a program called SDGs at Work so that students can learn more about it, and then when they have a work term, we send a questionnaire to all of our employers and all of our students. And we ask them one simple question, and it's a self-assessment. We say, during this work term, did the, did the students work contribute to an SDG? And if so, which one? And then we get employers and students telling us, and we're collecting that data now. We have over 15,000 employers who've told us about the SDGs that our students have helped advance or had an impact on. And we have over 8,000 students who've talked about the work they've done and how that's helped connect to an SDG and what that's meant for them. So this is helping us make the case that our students, and it'll be the same with your students, do more than just get hands-on experience that help them get a job. That's actually a means to an end. And the end is this purposeful, meaningful work. And part of that is doing something that the world needs. And we are we identify that with using the SDGs as a frame of reference. Does that help explain that? Yeah. 
great. Um, other thoughts or reflections? I mean, when, when you think of cooperative education or work integrated learning in your own context or what you might think about in the future, has this changed anything for you? Is there anything you might do differently or want to study differently? Peng, so you talked about evaluation of outcomes, for example, that that was interesting to you. You're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> it happens Sorry. to all of us. It happens to all of us. <laughs> yes. So I I came from yeah I came from Myanmar. So in our education system, we don't have uh, any like official inspirational learning uh, program, including mm -hmm. world program. So the um, mostly our internship and employer side business. So we do employer side visits and uh, like uh, maybe one day visit to the employer side. And um, some, some universities, some program, they have the internship, but mm -hmm. there is no standard for mm -hmm. thinking about how long the internship should be. And so uh, evaluation is also like uh, maybe how we call it. So it's making by our own. So for example, if students go to the uh, wobblies for one day, learn what they uh, what they, uh, they just learn the procedures and the function in the wobblies. They talk with the employers. Uh, that prior give the presentation. Some students uh, they note um, some information and they ask and they discuss. Some students don't do it. So after they come back, so we have to be uh, evaluate whether this one day uh, employer side visit is really effective for them or not. So at that time, so what we do is we just ask them like, uh, for example, uh, before we plan to go to the side visit, so maybe we plan some question. So after side visit, so we are expect them to be answered. It. So some student can uh, can answer, some student cannot answer. This is like our own way of developing the evaluation. So because mm -hmm. we don't have the experience like a kind of the wild will program. So that's why this kind of assessment and evaluation is need to be developed in Myanmar education system if we really want to go to the way program. Because there's a lot of problem in the country uh, regarding with the education. Um, so student learn, a uh, student including me learn engineering program without using computer in over 10 years ago. So what happened is we don't have inspirational learning. We only have the academic knowledge. This knowledge cannot be applied directly in the practical workplace. So mm -hmm. after graduated, the so most of the uh, students change their career. So they cannot think about their passion or they cannot think about uh, something they want to do. So they have to be thinking about something they have to be surprised. So that's yeah. why I think way program is really, really important for me. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And um, what do you think the challenges will be trying to get a program like that established? Most of the challenge, uh, firstly, so there were we have to think about the inclusive framework and also law to be amended by the uh, union government for the institute and also the employer as well. So employer in Myanmar also need to be actively involved in this program. If we implement the program, yeah. and if mm -hmm. there's nobody who collaborate in the program, so it will be challenges. Mm -hmm. And also according to the nature, Myanmar employers want uh, someone who already have the skill. So we have to educate them and because we send them to the, we send the student to their workplace who have no prior war experience. Right. So they have to be patient enough to train these uh, student to get employment skill. So I think there are a lot of challenges, including awareness among the employers to be engaged the way program, how this can be effect for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for their own business and also to contribute to their country as well. Yeah, yeah, very true. 
So Siriath, do you have similar challenges in Cambodia? How would you see, you said that you're interested potentially in, in a program like this for Cambodia. Is there, what's the story there? You're on mute. I'm sorry. No. That's okay. Um, I was talking. Thank you so much, uh, Professor, for um, asking me the question. A, a really a good question about uh, the challenges uh, in Cambodia related to um, cooperative um, program. Um, honestly, um, it is a, a big uh, challenges uh, for um, Cambodia nowadays. I just say nowadays um, for the cooperative program. Since um, in our country now, we we don't exactly have uh, that kinds of uh, program. We have just like like a technical school or something, but um, mm -hmm. uh, we we don't have a kind of uh, cooperative uh, program in Cambodia. Um, so if we aim to implement um, the program, it is uh, 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 a little bit uh, challenging, but. Uh, we can start, we can start. Um, what we are going to do first is about uh, like uh, um, training, uh, training of, of people, training individual about uh, how uh, uh, a cooperative uh, program is. Uh, so um, when uh, we have like uh, individual, like we have uh, uh, people, we have people who know about cooperative to a program who uh, understand about cooperative program, um, we can start it. I now am um, learning some uh, uh, something about a cooperative program, and I I I, I remember uh, what uh, Ajahn Virapong said. Ajahn Virapong told me that uh, uh, if uh, the cooperative program uh, implemented in Cambodia, you will be you will be uh, 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 the founder of uh, the co cooperative program in Cambodia. And I I really uh, I really appreciate what uh, he he was talking. Um, yeah, I, and and I accept that uh, there is no uh, a kind of uh, cooperative uh, program in Cambodia, and it it is uh, a bit challenging. But um, we can do that. We can do that uh, uh, through uh, uh, learning and uh, and practice. So uh, we can uh, we can do that. I think. Thank oh. you. Mm -hmm. Well, we all everyone starts somewhere, and uh, in this in at my university, as I said, they started it sixty five years ago, but they did it with with the community and with industry in the community. And the academic community worked with local government, worked with industry, and decided they wanted to do education in a different way. And that's how it started 65 years ago, when with leaders taking, taking that position. So you certainly might be able to do that yourselves in your own community, And but it does take that network. You can't do it by yourself, it's very difficult. Um, Minirat, any thoughts or observations from your perspective? For me, I, um, uh, Nora, so uh, how can we link this type of learning student who um, choose before learn in the university, like uh, choose the professional subject as a career path in Thailand, like of of like um no one guidance before before the student uh get into the university i mean like uh, um mm. when the student have to learn about the nurse nursing so they have no choice they need to uh pass the exam to be a nurse mm -hmm. so how can like um can they change after how how can we um guide I mean, um, uh, I mean, how how can we guide them before or after they learn or two or three years is not in the this program? How can they change or mm -hmm. how can they choose another way? Did you understand me? <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering. Okay. Do you do you have career offices at your university? Uh, if, I mean, in Thailand, 
some of the students have no chance to choose the way they want. Mm. Mm. It's like some 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 of the students need uh maybe they don't know they want to be a teacher, they don't know they want to be a nurse, mm -hmm. they also don't know they want to be uh or maybe um something like that. Mm -hmm. So when 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 they have to um to do the exam to do the to to go to the university, so they have no one guidance. That's right. And they don't know. They don't know what career. Yeah, yeah. Even um, even they learn about two or three years. Yeah, that's right. That can be very difficult because can't it? Because they'll start a program and they'll get into it, and maybe they feel like oh they don't like it, but then they're a bit stuck, right? So how can yeah. we how can they get more information earlier? Is there anything that happens in the high schools in Thailand? Yeah, are there high school programs that can start to because that often the what's really important, as you know, is um, students being exposed to different types of work or different types of careers or professions so that they can start making good choices. Um, in the Canadian context, this is often the role that cooperative education can play, is they may start in general studies. They might start in general science or general humanities or arts or, or, or you know, whatever, health programs. And then they get a couple of work terms and they explore different career opportunities. They develop a better understanding of what's available for them out there and then they start to focus in on professional programs so for example nursing uh, typically they'll do at least a couple of years of general science before they choose nursing and in those first few years if they can get a few work terms then they can really explore where science could take them and nursing might be one it could be uh, research, you know, could be all sorts of things, but it's getting that exposure early and opportunity to try different things, which is really powerful. And sometimes it can happen as early as high school, but that's, you know, I don't know what's, what, what the opportunity is in Thailand. Thank uh, you. You're welcome. Um, Songtam, did you have any uh, observations or anything that you wanted to add? For me, <clears throat> I think it is the ultimate goal. The the Ikigai model. It's not only for the employability and for the readiness for their career. I think Ikigai model is very, <laughs> is very challenge goal for us to to achieve for co-op students. Hmm. I I need to learn and study in more detail about the Ikigai model. Hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. Um any any thoughts about I'm not sure what you're studying next or where you are in your programs. Um where your research is, but uh, any thoughts about what you might do next in your program? For the research? Yeah, or any or courses you might, or are you finished all, your, do you take any courses or just research? research? After that, we have one more trimester. We have to learn more about our community education. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what, a uh, kind of knowledge I will also acquire in the next course yet. But so far, so we passed two course. So after this, so we already uh, we were finished two trimester. So as far as I'm concerned about this program, so it's racial learning and it's effect on the student uh, outcome. So that can be contribute to the uh, student themselves first and then mm -hmm. the employer and the uh, institute. This is the win-win-win situation. So uh, for me, I thought like like the kind of a cross-sectional study, 
uh, because um, so Thailand, so they have the core of experience, students have the core of experience. So yeah. I just want to know after that what happened to them. So this core of experience really affected to them or can they explore their old passion and career part? Hmm. And how about Myanmar students? So <clears throat> they don't have core of experience, but they have a kind of the inspiration learning experience like the employer side business or like the internship or like um, mm. some kind of observation in the workplace. So mm. I just think about like, um, so some group who already have the official core program, um, some group who don't have the official mm. um, program. So mm -hmm. I, I'm just wondering what will be the reserve if uh, I compare these two groups. So maybe uh, how about and this kind of experience affect on the decision making scale related with the career. So can this experience really support them in the decision making scale or not? Mm -hmm. So if a uh, Thailand student who already have the program, but it's not quite sure for them, even they have the experience, if I think so there is something uh, that need to be upgraded the system, right? So for mm -hmm. Myanmar, if students um, don't have the official experience, but uh, maybe they, they also have the similar condition in Thailand. So it, it's not usual. But if uh, some students found it, they, they're really clear about their career, but they're really clear about what they are going to be next. So what is strength with them? So even they don't have this official experience. So which factor contribute them to mm -hmm. be able to decide the right career path for the future. So I just want to be uh, think about this kind of research so far. I'm not quite sure yet because we still have one more trimester to learn. Yes. Very good, very good. And I'm sure you're familiar with the International Journal of Work Integrated Learning. Yes. Because there's, I would suspect there's quite a bit of um, quite a few articles that have been written in this space that might be interesting for you to look at and read uh, and research that's already happened about this so that that could help you construct your own research study if that's what you wanted to do for sure and and i had a question professor atit do your students ever um, engage with the co-op students that are at sut or co-op employers that are at sut um, they, they are not related directly because um, like the, the co-op student at SUT, uh, they are bachelor degree mm -hmm. and, and this group of students, they are uh, gra graduate students that uh, study yes. online. Yeah. So they never met, but but when when this group of students, I mean graduate students, want want to do research, they they can use uh, our system. I mean the Center of Cooperative Education to link them. Yeah, right. Good because you got access to how many students would be in your program? Lots and lots of students at the undergraduate level. About three three thousand. Yeah, 3,000. So that's a very good sample size for your graduate students to engage in research if they wanted to with uh, your own co-op students or even the employers that are engaging with your students. Yeah, that's great. And Thailand is such, as you know, such a rich history of co-op. Uh, when, when did you start, when did Professor Witchett first start the first program? Was it the 1980s, 1990s in Thailand? About 30 years ago. 30 years ago. OK, so yeah, so yeah, 1990 something. So there's, there's, a, there's a rich history for Cambodia, for Myanmar to look to uh, and learn from how, how that started, some of the challenges, how you got industry, how you got government support, how you got other universities to support. It's um, it's a great it's a great mentor and guide for you in your work. OK, any final questions or anything you want to ask? Ask me or want to mention or reflect upon before we wrap up? No, you're good.
OK, any last minute thoughts or questions? Doesn't seem like there are any. No, OK. Uh, well, I don't I don't have anything more to add, really. I appreciate your attention uh, and I, I wish you all the best in your studies. It's, it's very unique to have a program focused on cooperative education. Actually, it's very unique. When I did all of my work, I had to construct it all myself. And when I started. 30 years ago, there were no programs. There were there was no there was the research was very, very little very slim. There was a very small group of people doing this work. And so now you're joining a large global community of people who do this work. We're having our research symposium, the World Association that uh, Professor Atit is very familiar with. Um, we are having our international research symposium in June, and we expect over 100 researchers from around the world. There'll be a nice group from Thailand that'll be attending as well. Uh, and so it's it's wonderful you're joining a big family and I wish you all the best in your studies and I look forward to hearing hearing about your successes as you move through your program. All right. All right. No, no, right. Thank, thank you for sharing your insights and for engaging so thoughtfully with us today. You are your ability to invite complex concepts like activity theory, uh, Ikigai 5.0, and the pair model within the work integrated learning framework at the University of Waterloo was truly impressive. Um, as I as I told you before, your presentation was not only informative but delivered with an elegance that that captivated us all. Um, it is clear why your work is so respected and how you continue to inspire many within the academic community and beyond, uh, like like us um, in 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 the in the West community. Thank you once again for a memorable lecture and the significant impact you made on our learning journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's very kind, very kind of it. And Manira, did you have something you wanted to add before we close off? Okay, Nora. So I would like to know uh, why you choose to learn this program, because you said last thirty years ago no one like a uh, small uh -huh. small group to learn this program. Thank oh, that's you. A, that's a that's a great question. Um, I think first and foremost because it is my passion. So having worked in the field for many many years and seeing how students change and grow and develop so much when they take their studies into the world of work and develop and grow. I, I just saw it all the time and how truly they grew and they, they transformed. And when I was uh, working at the university, there was a sense that what students were learning during cooperative education wasn't as important as what they were learning in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do my research that demonstrated that the learning was actually very deep and powerful and as important as what's being learned in the classroom. So not to take away from one or the other, but to recognize the value of the learning that occurs as a result of cooperative education. So that was my motivation because I wanted to really promote the field as being a legitimate discipline in itself. So that's why. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Huh? And you will all pull it forward as well in your own way. OK. Oh, Sireth, did you want to add something or have a question? Thank you, Professor. Um, I, I don't I don't have um, any question, but I just want um, to say uh, thank you very much for um, your insightful um, uh, lesson and presentation about uh, purpose uh, clarity in the uh, wheel and uh, the ecosystem. Um, uh, from um, this lesson, I I have uh, learned a lot, but uh, I just want to uh, mention some um, points. I have learned like uh, uh, what you are talking about here. Here it is related to a pedagogy experience assessment reflection. This is a kind of um, uh, it framework, right? and also. Um, uh, what I am really interested in is um, about a wheel ecosystem. 
uh, like uh, you talk about community of uh, five stakeholders, and those mm -hmm. are action, host organization, education, government, and institution. And also, um, you gave me um, more understanding about uh, the connection between a uh, co-op program and the uh, uh, SDG about the uh, 17 goal. Um, finally, I would like to say um, thank you so much for your uh, lesson today. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to say um, goodbye and thank you and good night and kapkun ka. Kapkun ka. Kapkun ka. Kapkun ka. And I hope to see you all at some point in the future. I hope to see you all. Do, do take care. And I, I, I look forward to hearing about your successes. Okay. Thank you. Good thank night. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.